Hello and welcome to the debate. This is a UNICEF online discussion on early childhood development. Uh, recently, the Lancet has published a series of papers on early childhood development, the first in four years uh, to bring this subject to our attention. And it's an ideal opportunity to discuss international investment and national programs. Here in the studio, we're joined by Dr. Richard Horton, Chief Editor of The Lancet. Mm -hmm. And live in New York, we're joined by Dr. Nirpa Ulka, Chief of the Early Childhood Development Unit for UNICEF. If I can begin with you, Dr. Horton, it's been four years since the 2007 Lancet series. What do these new papers uh, published bring to the debate? Well, they bring a tremendous amount of new science and evidence to understand what's taking place with early childhood development. It's worth re just reiterating the finding of four years ago, which is that over 200 million children under five in lower middle income countries are unable to achieve their full potential. So we're talking about a huge hidden predicament for children. But what this work goes on to show is placing that predicament in the context of inequity. In other words, the, the problems that children face in the early years of their life then track out for the life course. If something goes wrong in those early years, then they suffer uh, over the rest of their life in educational attainment, in cognitive development, and also in the amount of income that they generate. But what this report also go goes on to do is to show what the risk factors are for early childhood development. And we've got a whole array of new discoveries here, which is what is so shocking. Uh, we now understand that intrauterine growth restriction, exposure to malaria and HIV, exposure to lead, maternal depression, institutionalization, and even societal violence can come together to really adversely affect the development of children. There are some real bright spots. We now know, for example, that maternal education uh, can be a protective factor, as can breastfeeding. So I think we've got a much greater understanding of what takes place in those early years, and we've got some clues for how we need to intervene to protect children so they can fully develop. So in terms of uh, looking at these findings, can we extrapolate the findings, particularly in early childhood development in developed countries, to low and middle income countries? The science that we've got now really is so convincing. It's been building up rapidly over the last five years that what we know today can be translated into programs and policies where children are most affected in low and middle income countries. We can be very confident about the science and very confident about the policies we need to help children. Dr. Ilka, do you feel that uh, these new developments in early childhood development uh, do mean that, that we can uh, extrapolate the findings? Definitely, and absolutely that we are on the right, right track uh, in terms of responding to children's developmental needs. This brings us back to a very important moral imperative, that now we are more responsible and accountable for making sure that those children who survive will develop their full potential. I think this Lancet series, this, these two Lancet papers, will make it clear that the, we are, as a global organization, uh, community, I responsible for making sure that these children thrive, develop their full potential. The big difference between the first Lancet series, which were published in 2007 and made a case for children uh, who are dying, and not developing their full potential, that, who are surviving but not developing their full potential, this time the evidence comes from developing countries. And uh, that is the most important uh, new contribution of the Lancet paper. We are not anymore talking about only the evidence coming from US or from Europe, but from countries where we can see that the programs, early childhood development programs, can make a difference in the lives of children. Uh, Dr. Horton, how strong is the evidence that these early childhood development interventions are not expenditure for a nation, but actually they're investments that will create an opportunity to accrue income in the longer term? The evidence is utterly convincing and compelling. We're talking about interventions that are effective and that are cost efficient. The return on investment is enormous. And so what we're spending on children uh, in these early years today is going to reap literally billions of dollars over their life course. 
And if that investment in the sort of earliest years for, for children is effective, what can we do to convince governments uh, that these investments are the right thing to do, particularly when they may be juxtaposed with investments in education, in health care or in nutrition? It's a tough challenge for governments right now. Uh, the focus in the world is very much on the Millennium Development Goals and hitting targets for 2015. We're going through the ravages of financial recession and economic crises. But I think what we have is a fantastic opportunity. We have the science and the evidence to show that we can make a difference. We have the institutions and the networks and the individuals who, are, who can be advocates for the evidence. So we have a window of opportunity now to really go that extra mile, to get this science implemented into practice. And I think over the course of the next couple of years, that needs to be our goal, to really translate this work into programs on the ground and get them scaled up. Earlier this week, we spoke to Nobel laureate and professor of economics at Chicago University, uh, Professor James Heckman. One of the basic findings, which is reported in the Lancet article, and it summarizes a lot of work in the last decade or so, some of which I've contributed to, but others, many others, as noted in the Lancet article, have as well, is that early investment, early stimulation, early, uh, early strategies can essentially reduce the cost of later strategies. But the key new concept that I don't think was present in the Millennium Development Goals was a sense of how the outcomes at one age were linked to the outcomes at an earlier age. So what we've learned is the sooner you invest, the better. The later remedial investments tend to be much less efficient. And in the, the body of evidence grows, it continues to grow, and it points to a timing. This doesn't mean, by the way, that you should shut everything down after the kid finishes preschool. Schooling, uh, later life, uh, training, all of these things matter. But we've got to get children, all children, onto the right trajectory so they can take advantage of all the opportunities that they will have as they go downstream, as they go into life, as they become adults. And the Millennium Development Goals simply didn't recognize this dynamic. Now I think we do, and so they should be amended. They should at least recognize this dynamic. That was Nobel laureate and professor of economics at Chicago University, James Heckman, speaking to us earlier this week. Dr. Ilka, yeah. what's your view on convincing governments that this is the right thing to do? First of all, uh, I'm so pleased with the Nick, uh, second round of Lancet papers, which, ha which have demonstrated evidence from developing countries, what really works. So when, when the uh, low and middle income countries see that countries like their, uh, similar to their economic and social uh, characteristics can do it and it can happen, this would be one of the ways of convincing governments that it, uh, the, to invest more in early childhood development programs. And the uh, second thing is that when we talk about early childhood development programs, we always it's a kind of mystical term, early childhood development. What is it? We need to unpack. We need to come up with modalities, modes of services that could be uh, brought to the attention of uh, the governments and policymakers and implementers. And also uh, looking into issues like um, how parents and communities see early childhood development programs because we quite often focus on policymakers and do not uh, pay enough attention to uh, service receivers. So thinking but, about uh, those programs, thinking about those programs, Dr. Ilka, uh, which of those programs demonstrate the best ability to um, go to scale, thereby reaching the hundreds of millions of children who would be in need of early childhood development? Okay, there are some very simple and uh, quick wins that we can uh, work on, and there are some more comprehensive programs that we can uh, think about it and plan it more for longer and uh, longer term uh, periods. For example, UNICEF together with WHO and also uh, with other partners have been developing a program called Care for Child Development, which was a very simple uh, set, which includes simple set of messages for families counseling the mothers on 
very simple interactional processes, uh, communication between the newborn baby and the mother or the caregiver. And that is uh, that can be easily mainstreamed into ongoing health and nutrition interventions, which is very low cost, but a high impact, high, high return. Pre-primary programs are extremely important for school achievement and uh, on a timely school entrance. I think uh, there's already an awareness about how pre-primary school uh, or pre-primary education can be scaled up. We can also look at more social protection policies, community-based interventions from a wider perspective, making sure that children who are uh, growing up will not be left alone in the streets or under the supervision of another child, because this is, this is also another important area that we should be looking into. Uh, affordable child care, which can be scaled up very quickly. I think if I we're think really going to make a difference, we've got to have a fundamental change in our philosophy. And I think those of us in the health sector feel very comfortable working in health, uh, but often we don't step outside of our silo into other areas. And I think people working in the education sector do exactly the same. People working in poverty often do the same, and in nutrition. And what we have to do is find a different way of working. We have to work across sectors so that we integrate services uh, in terms of early learning, in terms of health, in terms of nutrition, in terms of poverty reduction. And this is a complete change in philosophy, really. It's really thinking about how you combine interventions for children not working in very narrow vertical programs. So is this a time for a radical change for governments, for non-governmental non organizations and development agencies to think completely differently instead of in their silos and particular programs to think about the whole life cycle of a child and to launch interventions in that way. Radical change is the only way we're really going to tackle this problem. If we're if we're really serious about tackling disparities, if we're really serious about equity, then we've got to do things differently. It's no more incremental change as we've been doing with the Millennium Development Goals, often very successfully, but now if we're really going to make a difference for children, we've got to, our programs have got to be fully integrated. And that, that is going to be a big challenge, and I think that's what our advocacy has really got to focus on now. This brings us back to this radical change of uh, how governments and uh, international agencies will be working together in an integrated and coordinated manner, which is something that we can, we can start with early childhood development programs because this is the raison d'etre in a way for effective early childhood development programs right, start, uh, right from the beginning of life. But it is not easy and there is a big challenge for that. Dr. Ilka, earlier you were talking about some successful parenting programs, but not all the evidence for parenting programs has uh, been found to be effective. Uh, should this still be the approach, uh, developing parenting programs, or are there alternatives? Um, parenting programs are important. As we have earlier uh, stated, and the Lancet papers, also the uh, Harvard University's uh, reports on uh, brain development, early stimulation, tell us that interaction between the child and the mother or caregiver and early experiences of, ch of the child have a great impact on child's brain development, which has long-term imp uh, impact on child's physical and mental health and uh, emotional and social competencies. From that point of view, we definitely have to make sure that parents are aware of the child's developmental uh, needs, and parents should be also sensitive and responsive to child's needs. And thinking about m uh, mental uh, and uh, or maternal depression, as it comes from the paper one, how are we going to expect from those parents to be effective parents unless we provide support and coach them and uh, facilitate that interactive and positive interaction between the mother, uh, between the child, newborn child, and the caregiver. This is extremely important, not also only for child's development, but also child's survival and nutrition. I think it is the time to look at parenting programs from a more systematic perspective and see how those parenting programs could become part of the social uh, service delivery mechanisms 
be it health, nutrition, education, social protection, and child, uh, child protection as well. Thank, thank, thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Um, Dr. Dr. Horton, I wanted to ask, in terms of brain development, this seems to be a recurring theme in the papers. Is, are there other programs alongside parenting that can enhance brain development? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we've already talked about preschool enrollment, and that's crucial, and that shows the clear, massive return on investment. But in, in addition to that, the new science that these, this series reports shows some very interesting trends. For example, in new education media. We should be very positive about the role that television and radio can play in supporting children and families in terms of their cognitive developments. So I think we've now got an array of tools. We've got preschool enrollment, we've got parenting programs, we've got educational media, and we've got conditional cash transfer programs, and we're looking at other types of arrangements that might work. We've got a menu of options that now we know work, and that's what's so exciting about this new research. So this new research creates a platform for change and uh, when we look at the Millennium Development Goals there is scarce uh, reference to early childhood development. In a post Millennium Development Goal world what should we be doing next? Well thanks to the UN Secretary General's global strategy on women and children's health we have now unprecedented global attention to reproductive maternal newborn and child health that is a fantastic breakthrough, a tremendous opportunity. But now we have to ask ourselves the question, what is the point of saving a child's life if we are going to abandon that child in their early years? What is the point of saving a mother's life if we're not going to invest in that mother's children? We need to work differently, we need to think differently, and this series provides the manifesto for radical change. Dr. Ilka in New York, Dr. Horton in the studio. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.